Welcome to Soap, a story of the Tates and the Campbells, whose normal life is anything but normal, with co-hosts Tom Diamond, Vicky Ray, Jesse Fultz, and Keith Chowko. Soap operas come and go, but there has never been a soap opera like Soap. Welcome to Literary License Podcast, and today we're doing an interview with Jennifer Salt. She is a producer, screenwriter, and former actress. You might know her from um, movies such as Sisters, Hi Mom, The Wedding Party, and of course she did the film Gargoyles in 1972, and she has been a special guest star on numerous TV shows, and we also love her and know her as Eunice Tate from Soap. Hello, Jennifer. Welcome to Literary License Podcast. Hi. Hi, Jennifer. So I thought we'd start this interview um, basically from the very beginning. And I guess you were born in Los Angeles, California, and your father was Waldo Salt, one of the greatest script writers in Hollywood history. And your mother was um, actress Mary Davenport. So what was it like growing up in Los Angeles, California? Well, uh, that's an interesting story, quite a story, because I didn't quite grow all the way up in Los Angeles. Uh, <laughs> My dad, Waldo, was blacklisted in, um, I'm trying to think, I, I guess 1951 or so. So we actually fled California yeah, uh, to New York. And, and uh, he tried to make a living there before in the film business. Uh, so it was a big, a big change, a big drama in the family life. And you also went to um, the High School of Performing Arts. Um, for some of our listeners out there, I guess the High School of Performing Arts will probably always be associated with fame. fame. But <laughs> and then you went on to Sarah Lawrence College. Um, so what was it like going to high school at Performing Arts? The truth is, is that I went to Performing Arts because I had to go somewhere other than the local high school, the public high school. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, th that wasn't going to do so for my my family. So what I did was I tried out for all of the special schools: music and art, performing arts, hunter, um, hunter, uh, Bronx science. I tried out for all of them, but uh, I only got into performing arts. I tried out as an actress, and I hadn't. I was a bit young to know that I wanted to be an actress. It was okay. Uh, I I feel like so much of what we did was more suppressive than it was encouraging. Uh, I, there were a lot of rules about things you mustn't do when you act that were were seemed more important than things like allowing your imagination to fly. Mm. So that's what it was like. Although you know it was very formative, and I a lot of my friends were there and. You also did several stage appearances, um, and you won a theater award in 1971 as Estelle in the play Father's Day. Um, what was that like working on, on Broadway? Well, we didn't work for very long on Broadway because we closed on opening night. <laughs> but, but I had <laughs> two weeks of previews uh, working on Broadway. Amazing working with those actors. That, that, was, that was Marion Seldes and Brenda Vaccaro itself. Uh, it was sort of a, the Haley, the playwright, uh, sort of saw it as a kind of modern day Three Sisters. I don't, anyway, it, w it was very intense and very inspiring and wonderful for me. Hard, hard, because I was not uh, as confident as I, I I did read that you were at Sardi's, you guys were celebrating, and then you had runners back then that told you whether it was a go or a no-go? That's exactly right. Opening night, somebody came over and whispered in my ear because his runner had found out 
uh, I think it was Brenda's manager, came over and whispered in my ear, don't come to work tomorrow. Oh, wow. That's uh, some news, huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's an unpleasant... Uh, Disappointing. Evening. Now, you became associated with Brian De Palma, who's one of my all-time favorite directors. Mm-hmm. What was it like working with him on the wedding party, Hi, Mom and Sisters? Because that must have been... I mean, he's kind of, his acting style, the way he had, is kind of more of a naturalistic acting style, isn't it, with Brian De Palma? Yes, and you know, it's just about this whole life with Brian. He went to Sarah Lawrence. He was a graduate student, uh, the only male there at the time, and uh, our theater teacher was his mentor. So he came and became part of the. So I, he became, uh, we became very, very close. Um, we were great friends. We still are. I, he just had his 80th birthday wow. uh, in a Zoom party. So. <laughs> Uh, but we, we, we became great friends right away and had great chemistry. And so he was always part of, of my, uh, life and his naturalistic style. It was sort of beyond naturalistic in those days. It was more like, here's what I want you to do. Make it up now, you know, sort of just improvise and create your character. And, but these are the, th- my, my thing was mostly about how could I Brian laugh? That seemed to be my motivation and my, uh, in all of those movies, even though they were horror movies, I like, I, I sort of knew the the wink that he always had in his movies. So, uh, but they were so yeah. much fun to watch and so intense, especially sisters, you know, it is very intense. That was really intense. A lot of it. Love that movie. The the film the film the way they filmed it and it was just it was it was just something you didn't go to the bathroom. You wanted to finish it from start <laughs> to end. You know, you just held it. <laughs> when I first watched it, I think we covered that movie particular in a podcast. Oh really? Yeah, once upon a, I did yeah, read though, did however, it. that yeah. that um, people were attracted to your cooking, and that's why everybody used to hang out with you. <laughs> Well, and that was the only reason, darn. <laughs> <laughs> but I did not cook, and it was my way of. Uh, mm-hmm. It was it was my social relation. You know, it was a it made me comfortable with people. I I knew how to cook, and I loved to cook, and pleasing them in that way was, and still is, sort of my favorite thing. I watched an interview with Margot Kidder and she was talking about your cooking and she said that one time she was trying to cut up beans or something and she just gave up and she decided to let you have the kitchen. <laughs> she gave up early on <laughs> and she she got the picture early on. She was going to get bossed and <laughs> she quit and I thought she was more than happy to quit. Oh my God, it was great. Um, you also worked with your mom and, um, of course, in Hi, Mom, um, and Sisters. What was it like working with your mom on screen? Well, uh, she wasn't in Hi, Mom. But oh, no, sorry. Sisters, and then she was in a later couple of movies of Brian's later. Oh, okay. Uh, me, but working with her and Sisters was so much fun. It was so much fun. I never would have admitted that because our relationship in the movie – was a very good representation of our move, our relationship in life, which was incredibly cranky. I was very cranky with my mother and very judgmental. So, <laughs> so that is fun about the stuff in Sisters and what was about us. So poor mom, I never really told her how, how much fun it was. But Brian loved well, it really, I mean, I have to sit there and say that scene really works very, very well. I'd say it's one of my favorite scenes when you're both in the car and yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> works very well. And diet pills again. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you worked with um, Herbert Ross, John Schlesinger, uh, obviously Brian De Palma and Robert Altman. Who was your favorite director? Are you allowed not to have a favorite director? Well, I would say... Brian, of course, because it just was always fun. It was never uh, precious or his 
the things he was worried about were not about me and my bad acting or my misinterpretation or whatever. He, we enjoyed one another's company and he, he was a kind of cranky person on set, but I felt very comfortable with it somehow because I knew so well. So those were the fun times. Those were definitely the fun. Not that I didn't have a good time working with the Ross. I don't think he liked me too much, <laughs> but uh, whatever. And, and also in one of those scenes, uh, in, in, it was played against Sam, and Woody Allen was so funny in the scene that I got the giggles. And <laughs> I couldn't stop giggling, and they had to do take after take after take. And it was like three in the morning. And, I oh, no. and once I started giggling, I couldn't quit. So that was... That was pretty fun. It wasn't contagious giggling? <laughs> it was for a bit, and then everybody else was like, all right, so. <laughs> um, but I did love Diane very, very much. Um, you asked about Altman? Oh, that was uh, Yeah, Robert. Yeah, that was so great. That was a ton of fun. I, I must say, I, I'm, I overlooked that when I said Brian was my favorite, because you know, it was only one experience, uh, but he really liked improvising. I the whole character that I came to Houston to play, and we all went out to dinner one night, and because I, I guess I was sort of a hippie or something, my hair was in braids, and he looked at me and he said, oh, that's who you are. You're Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. You're a whole other, I see who you are. And then he gave me a whole new costume and a whole new thing. And I showed up on set having no idea what I was going to do. And it was out of left field. It was so crazy. And it had nothing to do with anything we had talked about. And it was all, all improvised, made up. So there you go. There you go. We're working with Brian De Palma, um, especially on Sisters. What was it like working? Because I mean, that's quite a technical film. You know, we have a lot of, um, you know, one shots and this, you know, camera. And I mean, and in those days, I mean, the cameras were quite big to make it down some corridors and stuff. Was that quite tricky? Yeah, it was. You know, it was a lot about the lighting and a lot about lighting, and you know, and then we had to coordinate those uh, split screens. So mm-hmm. that was pretty crazy. Uh, that that was those were a difficult few days shooting all that stuff. Yeah, mm-hmm. he knew yeah. what he wanted, and Woody had ever done those split screens before that I can remember. Anyway, yeah, no, that's what I quite liked about Brian De Palma's body of work. It's just like it's a feast for the eyes and the ears. I always found. Yes. And, yeah. And. I always like, and he also loved using um, Pino, um, what's that? Pino Donaggio, the composer as well. Uh-huh. Loved, loved his scores and stuff as well. Then we, then he went into television to work with Susan Harris on Soap. That's that was such a groundbreaking show back in the day. I mean, you really did a, a tackle. I mean, although be comedic, quite a few you know, issues that people were all thinking about and afraid to talk about, and you turned it into something brilliantly funny. You know, and, and I was watching an episode with you the other night ago where you were, you know, um, picking on Danny Dallas, where he kept picking you up and, you know, Benson and all were trying to get him, you know, to put you down because he was going to shake you. You guys all had such amazing chemistry on we set. Did. You we- were... So yeah. funny. I mean, I forgot how much I enjoyed it until I watched it with, you know, older eyes. Now I can appreciate it more. Yes, and it was very clever. It was brilliant. I mean, um, what was it like working with such a large ensemble cast as well? I know you had Catherine Hellman and just everybody there. Well, you know, once again, I would say in that situation, I had a lot of fun and I loved everyone. But I think I, I always carried with me a sense that I wasn't quite the sitcom actress that I wanted to be for, you know, that I couldn't meet the challenge in the way that some of these people like Catherine Hellman and, and Catherine Damon and, 
and uh, Richard Mulligan and uh, Ted Wass, Danny. Yeah. Uh, they had a finesse and they had a, uh, they went to the camera, they invited the camera, and I never felt that easy doing that. I, I was a different kind of actress and, and I, so I, I, I worried a lot about that. Um, but, you know, there's always that. I think if you talk to anybody and they're honest, they'll tell you <laughs> what it was they, they worried about in themselves. If you felt a certain way, we would have never have known it because you made it look mm-hmm. so easy, you know, well, being, being the social climber <laughs> on the sitcom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you were so haughty to everybody. You did it so well. I yeah. mean, you all had certain nuances and you brought them all into this show and it, it, you just made it work. And, and it was just a pleasure to turn on all the time and watch it. Now you've got it on DVD and you just pushed in and it works. And you're just like, God, no commercials. You just sit there and just laugh. I was laughing there a night ago. My husband's going, what are you in there giggling about? Because I was watching it my computer like I forgot how much fun this was it's great I mean you have to admit though I mean the part of Eunice I think you probably have one of the hardest <laughs> roles anyway because it is the straight the straight man rule Eunice yeah. is. he's the almost you know the voice of reason with a little bit of wackiness but she is the voice of reason she's she doesn't have all the the wackiness that's, she's kind of like the straight person with the wackiness going around her which must be quite a difficult role to play i always find the straight man the most difficult role well it is when you're in a comedy for sure <laughs> but but I, <laughs> yes, but i you know okay i guess i still have never quite made up my mind if that's because it was a tough role or because i did not meet the challenge of making her particular haughtiness funny enough or quirky enough i guess is what i mean or inter- uh, that i didn't that I didn't find the zany, the zaniness. I was, I could be haughty and, and it could, could be kind of silly, but I know exactly what you're talking about. And I, 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 I'm not sure how I feel about it. Cause I'm maybe I blame myself for that. <laughs> it really did work. You were very quirky for the record. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, Soap um, came out of, got a lot of attacks. It's one of these shows that was very, very popular, but got a lot of attacks from, I guess, the, the conservative Bible Belt, I guess we can say, um, situation. Um, what, um, but with having, but then you look at an, um, a series that's actually done by a very strong woman in Susan Harris, who would go on to do you know, Golden Girls and Benson and Empty Nest. Um, what was that like working with such a strong female? I mean, she must have been, you know, always, you know, fighting to get her point across. No. To be able to. No. She didn't. Iconic. She was, she stayed behind the scenes mostly. She was shy. She had never done a bunch of TV before. It was just something she kind of thought she could do and did. You know what I mean? It was just like some part of her wrote it but she she was a very private and shy person and almost took no credit at all uh and she she was some of the time romantically and some of the time not romantically in a steamer who was our producer and he really covered her and took care of her and and adored her, I think. And she was great. I, I, she was fantastic, but she was not a fighter. Uh, he took he took on all the battles. Mm. He was very strong. Um, I have to then say that soap has these moments of like pure comedy, but then they can tear your heart out at the same moment. Which um, you know, it's it's very kind of it's kind of rare. I mean. Um, okay, I know that most sitcoms, what you normally get is funny, 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 and then you might get the odd episode. But Soap was able to do that time and time again, you know, you know whether it was Catherine Hellman over the loss of Chester or the death of a character or, um, or Mary, find, you know, coming to terms with Jody, her son's, you know, homosexuality. Um, did you realize that at the time that you're kind of breaking the ground that, you know, 
that wasn't really broken. I mean, All in the Family broke a lot of ground in Mary Tyler Moore, but Soap was probably a show that took everything a bit further than... One step further. One step further. It took the sort of sentimental, sentimental, you know, emotional, tear-jerking side very seriously as well as the comedy. And, and that, was, that was an amazing thing about the show. And I, I had not watched a lot of sitcoms, so I didn't know that we were breaking ground, but I knew that that was a very big part of what they were going for. And I know that Catherine Hellman was sort of a master of that. Yeah. I, I found her relationship with Benson, uh, with Robert Guillaume, really, really moving. It was very meaningful because they yeah. were such friends, even though he was obnoxious to her, but he still loved her. And he you can tell her. that she still loved him character wise. It, it was, was it was a great relationship. I think that the actors found that and then it became something they wrote to, if you know what I mean. That's there there's an example of you know fantastic acting that in the middle of all this madness i also find that um soap is probably will probably go down in history as one of the zaniest but one of the ones that has so full of heart yeah 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 i think that's true hmm. now you've done a lot of um guest starring on various shows like Love Boat, Murder, She Wrote, etc. Yeah. What's it like going into a show that's um, a show that's already established and doing a guest spot? <laughs> <laughs> well, there she go. That sums it all up without any more commentary. <laughs> hard. Everybody, nobody knows each other, but the, you know, this core cast knows each other. The crew knows the core cast. They're all a little family, and you're just coming in and completely... Uh, doing your own thing. Doing your own thing. And in those shows, directors are not... They're, they're worried about the camera or the light fading. or There are all kinds of things. They don't want to think about the acting. You never really get feedback. So you don't have any idea what you're doing. Uh, because nobody's going to tell you anything. Uh, the other actors you don't know, so they wouldn't say anything, and the m- main cast doesn't isn't interested. They're busy trying to get out of their costumes and go home. So it, it's not really a way to go. Yeah. <laughs> if you can afford it. Oh, sorry, my cat. Sorry. Let's go. <laughs> we have pets sitting around us when we're doing this all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you did get to work with... Um, you know, Susan Harris again on an episode of Empty Nest. Yes, that was What good. was that like to revisit um, some actors that you worked with in the past? Was that a slightly different Empty experience? Nest. I did Empty Nest and I did, oh no, she didn't write It's a Living. I'm sorry. Yeah, that was with Thomas. But she, um, it was fine. I, d- I don't remember even seeing Susan when I did The Empty Nest. But I'll tell you one thing. It was fun to work with Richard. And it was kind of shocking because he was, everybody had always said, this is Richard Mulligan. Everybody had always, who worked with him said he would never give you a hint in rehearsal about what he was going to do. So that when you were on camera, all this kind of crazy stuff, you know, that kind of madness that he had. Um, (laughs) he, he, He saved it for the camera. So that as the other actors in the scene, or if you're doing a one-on-one with him, it was disconcerting and you had to be quite on your toes to, to run with it, you know? And some people resented it and some people were very, uh, some people adored it. Uh, and I never really paid attention to all these stories. So what happened was in that scene, the one scene I had with him in Empty Nest, he completely came out of left field. I had no idea <laughs> what he was going to do. I don't remember what it was, but it was very shocking. And it was fun. It was definitely fun, but it was very shocking to me. Well, Usually you have everything sort of worked out and figured out. Well, I guess your um, early days with um, Robert Altman and Brian De Palma's um, and all the um, improvisation probably helped you a little bit there. <laughs> so, that's, what, that's a good way to look at it. <laughs> in 1998, you turned your, um, 
your skills to script writing with Sins of the City and the stalking of Laurie's show. But then um, you started doing it more frequently with Nip Tuck with Ryan Murphy. So when did you decide to turn your hand to script writing? Somewhere around the time that I did, that I was doing guest shots on, um, what was it called? You know, the Tom Selleck show, Magnum P.I. Magnum P.I. And uh, Murder, She Wrote. I knew it was just, I was not happy. And I knew something else had to happen. I had read that you decided that, that, um, that uh, you you knew that Hollywood sometimes kind of kind of chewed you up and spit you out as a woman, and it was kind of an ageist thing back in the day, or whatever. Uh, or, and you decided you wanted to go into screenwriting. I don't think I felt that. Uh, I don't know where you read that, but I wish I had had something clever like that, like Hollywood chews you up. I mean, that's a very common feeling. I looked so young for my age that I couldn't get yeah. good parts. I couldn't get parts that in any way reflected my own uh, age or experience. I, I I couldn't even play a mother with kids when I was 30, you know? So it was, it wasn't that. It was just, I, I wasn't happy acting. I just, it wasn't, I think I'm a more... Um, I guess shy is the only word I can, good word I can come up with. Somebody encouraged you to take a writing course? My friend, Jill Clayburgh. I said, I I love Jill Clayburgh. For me, she's always Pippin when she sings and (laughs) Pippin on the original thing. And in her movies, every time Jill Clayburgh's in a film, I've always went and see it ever since I was a kid. It's like Jill Clayburgh. Sarah Lawrence together. So so she was a real, uh, she was very, very, we were very close. And uh, sh- I, I went through this period where I just kept bursting into tears and not knowing what was wrong with me. It was almost like a mini nervous breakdown. And she sat down with me and said, we have to start making a list of things you could do. She liked to be sensible about life. Mm-hmm. And uh, she said, I have a feeling about the writing. And, she, you know, it was not something that I had done but I had a feeling of being drawn to it. And we had a friend who told us about, told her and me together about this writing class that she went to. And I joined up and over the next couple of years, I wrote a screenplay in that class. Um, and that screenplay sort of gave me an entree. And then it Somebody hired me for a job. I called my acting agent and said, do not send me out ever again. <laughs> I just quit so easily. It was like, boop, on the phone. Yep, that's it. We're done. And I never looked back. Well, I had to sit there and say, I mean, I, I script write and I write and I had to sit there and say, I prefer having control of my characters and my writing were when I used to do a little bit of performing, you don't really have that much control. So, and I like to be judged for what I created than what someone else has created for me. Do you know what I mean? So I find it liberating. Uh Uh-huh. Well, I, you know, I understand that and I very well. And I also understand that there's a way you are seen and judged as an actor that is very uh, distracting. Mm -hmm. And for me, uh, and sitting in a room with, you know, my my dirty hair and it all going on up in my head and feeling great confidence in that, um, mm-hmm. feeling confidence in my mind rather than confidence in my, how I was appearing to other people, which I think was very distracting to me. Right. Um, it was a big, big uh, I, I didn't know that such a thing was possible. Mm. I, I fell in love with writing. I did find it interesting. Um, I, was your first screenplay, It Ain't Over Till It's Over? It was about a woman turning 40 who recently lost her father and finds her life is up for grabs, I guess, so to speak. Yes, that's exactly right. Gosh, you've done your research. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, <laughs> and it was, you know, kind of my story. I thought it was, was because I know that your father wasn't, you know, a big presence in your life, and it seemed like you were kind of writing about yourself in essence. Mm-hmm. In and it landed you an agent, I believe, did it not? It did. It did. That was amazing. And it wouldn't happen today. It's a different yeah. world, I imagine. Yeah, a different world. Writing for Nip Tuck was, uh, it was just, it was such a journey, and it was so good. Uh, it started out very difficult because I'd never worked in TV, and I didn't know a lot. So I had to learn the hard way. Um, but working with Ryan has always been wonderful in a very particular way, which is that he really gives you permission to take take things to the limit. And not only does he give you permission, that's that's not correct. What he does is he pushes you to it. And it's never been my uh, impulse to take things that far, to go that out there uh, with things that people do and stuff. And so what happened was it was sort of like it became a really perfect marriage for me because I I, 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 I'm very grounded. I, I guess, you know, people say it's because I'm a Virgo, but I'm very much grounded in the uh, reality. And I sometimes can't get out of, you know, lift myself out of those shoes. And, uh, and he would push me so hard that I would just have to take the leap because that was the job. And because Ryan, in a lot of ways, I had, I've had a relationship with him a lot like Ryan, although Certainly, Brian was a lot less uh, intimidating. Brian is a much more uh, powerful presence, but but we really got along, and I like I, I felt like he got my sense of humor, and he got my writing, and and uh, so the combination of us was pretty good. He would I would do something that couldn't be done, you know. I would make something seem real that nobody. Could, would believe that this fabulous doctor was going to actually take this sex home and have sex with it. Nobody believed right. that he knew that. And, and then it was my job to make it happen and in, in some really big way that he had the sex doll line had sex. <laughs> that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Well, it looked like you got to take things further with your next work with um, Ryan Murphy, The American Horror Story. Big fans of that. Big, huge, huge fans. American Horror Story. (laughs) Wow. Um, Love, love, love. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've seen stuff in American Horror Story that I never thought I'd see on TV. (laughs) Oh, oh my God, I know. Boy, talk about taking it to the limit. (laughs) There's some things like... This is not prime time. To, well, this is FX, so how are they doing this? Not that it wasn't brilliant or fabulous, but it's just like, boy, this is on regular TV. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, John Landgraf was very seminal in that and in protecting Ryan and and uh, letting him be Ryan, knowing that there was much in it for everyone, <laughs> not, <laughs> not just because he was but you know he understood the power of Ryan um, audaciousness, and it looks also that you are also written a script for Ratchet, which is coming out soon this week, Friday on Netflix. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. With Sarah Paulson, they couldn't have picked a better person for Nurse Ratchet to tell you the truth. I know. She she's pull so it right up. Excuse she's me. Amazing. She's amazing in the show. She's just stunning. It's the whole show is quite something. And I'm looking forward to it. This well, we covered uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest last year. So it's going to yeah. be interesting to see what they do with the ratchet character and move her forward because she's, 
It's funny that once you had Louise Fletcher do One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, the character of Nurse Ratchet now has a life of her own. So it'd be interesting to see what this life is now. So Right. Yeah. It, it's not Louise Fletcher's life, I'll tell you. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I know. It's our Paulson's life. <laughs> yeah, it's our Paulson's life now. Yeah, I so. think that, that uh, you know, I don't, uh, my personal opinion is that Nurse Ratchet, the nurse... Ratchet, in the dust back there, and this became Ryan Murphy, Nurse Ratchet, and it was a whole other. It's a whole other thing because it's horror, really, and uh, so it goes way deep. I mean, I guess you can think that all these things that happened to her before she got to the cuckoo's nest uh, really happened, but. Ah! Yeah. It doesn't look like she, it looks like she has a lot of amazing experiences before she gets to the cuckoo's nest. <laughs> she looks a whole lot in, more insane than Louise Fletcher ever looked as that nurse ratchet. You know, she started mm. out so twist, so troubled. Mm. I did notice, you know, she said if somebody, I think I, the first trailer of a Ratchet I saw yesterday, as a matter of fact, she said if people were kind to me, then things might have been different as well or something to that effect. And it kind of is like, ooh, this is going to be good. <laughs> yeah, it's that sick, twisted narcissism, psychopathic narcissism where she actually thinks somebody else is responsible for her being, you know what I mean? For being such a twisted soul, but anyway. Yeah, yeah I kind of figured right. she's going to lobotomize somebody according to the trailer, and I was just like, no. <laughs> no eyeballs. <laughs> Now, you've got to fasten your seat belts here. Yeah, I, I bet. It looks like it's going to be fabulous. I can't wait to watch. I'm really looking forward to Friday. And you cannot believe these other actors that are in it. I mean... Sharon Stone. Sharon Stone. Judy Davis is so good. I love Judy Davis. Um, Sophie Okonedo is in it. She's so amazing. You can't believe it. Uh, Cynthia Nixon. Yep, yeah, her too. Oh, she, uh, oh it's it's so good. Mm-hmm. I know, I can't wait to watch. Yeah. Brian Murphy, you also got an, um, a chance to actually produce. How do you how do you like the role of producer or co-producer or executive producer? Well, um, being a producer, to be perfectly honest, is just what you do when you're on. A TV show because that's you are a producer and a writer because what you do on this TV show is you you're a writer's room and you do as much or as little as is necessary or part of this showrunner's uh, way of doing things but you figure out the season you see the season you create a season so it isn't just in some way, it isn't just the writing. It's not the dialogue. It's not the, the scripts that you hand in. It's the weeks and weeks and weeks of creating the show, really, um, that, that, that are about something kind of larger than the actual pending of a, an episode. You also um, wrote the script for, or the screenplay for Eat, Pray, Love, which is based yeah. on the best-selling um, memoir of the same name by Elizabeth Gilbert. What was it like to take a book and to change this into a screenplay? What was that experience like? It was very uh, challenging, really challenging. Uh, I think that it took a long time for me to really see it the way Ryan wanted me to see it, and and I did ultimately. But it, but I had a much more arty farty kind of <laughs> approach to it, and then, and then um, when once the studio was involved, it was very clear that what we were going for was had all the glamour and glitz of the actual book in the sense that the book was this beloved iconic bestseller. So in some way, the book that Elizabeth Gilbert just became like the Julia Roberts of, of memoirs. You know what I mean? It, it was right. shiny and bright and delicious. Like and, Aaron Brockovich is Julia Roberts, right. that kind of thing. 
there are some stories that just she embodies in some way, and that was the way everybody saw saw this Elizabeth Gilbert's character. And I had, you know, I had I had to come out of my own uh, comfort zone. My arty farty zone. Your arty farty zone. Okay, that'll work too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you think- you know, I to play with time and you know go out of sync. And everyone was very impatient with me, and I think they were probably right. Uh, but I would say that what you see is is what what was written, uh, and it was you know n- not ultimately not a struggle. Uh, it just was for a while for me to adjust, but I. I think it turned out really, really well. I really mm, liked it, did. it a whole lot. Um, I know it didn't get the best reviews, but oh, I don't um, know why not. I did. Um, I'm like I said. I'm. I was reading, um, and that it said that you might have uh, it translated well into this role. I guess you were having a hard time translating her meditation from the book into the filmography. <laughs> you were because meditation was hard to translate into the filming. Yes. And what did you read? Um, that you were trying to figure out how to take the meditation from her book and try to translate it into the film where it made sense, her meditating, I guess. Yeah. And it also uh, said that you were, um, you, were, you were a seeker yourself, and that's why it kind of stood out to you a little bit, the script. You know, I think, yes. Um, I, th- that's all true. And the guru in the book... And, and ultimately in the movie, who never makes an appearance, was my guru. I was involved with that particular, um, you know, ashram and, and guru. So I knew it all very, very well. And so I think part of what I'm telling you is that I had, I, I was pretty attached to the way things really were. And I think it might have been a bit arcane for the audience who's watching the movie um my understanding might have been a little too uh i don't know just not transparent enough for people to understand what she was going through and to see the comedy in it really Mm -hmm. Um, the comedy was 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 obvious but i think you're trying to show the relevance of a human being's awakening and trying to transition her life and i think that was accomplished during the film I, I think I mean I love the movie, so I guess it was a conflict. You know, it was it was so different than I than I imagined it. But but I I really did love it, and I thought Julia was just gorgeous. She was great in it. She was excellent. Fantastic. Part of the literary license podcast, what we do is the first month, the first week of each month, we do a weekly show. The first week we actually read a book and compare it to the screen version. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, it's I don't think people realize that they are two very very different ways of telling a story and yes you know enabled to get the essence but i have to sit there and say that i have read um the book and i did see the film and i think that you captured captured it very very well i, I enjoyed the script for it very very much so good that's yeah. good that's yeah, i liked it yeah i'm a person that's full of self-doubt and i can't mm-hmm. uh to I think up. everybody feels that at some point or another i think it translates well into everybody's life yeah. Yes. yes. I always was surprised that, you know, when she was so unhappy in the beginning and set off on this journey, that is the thing that all these people objected to when they saw the movie. You know, it was almost like, hey, lady, he's nice, he's handsome, he's a decent person. Why you got to turn on him? Why you got to be so unhappy? Mm-hmm. You know, he doesn't beat you. It, it felt almost like that, like, right, like she yeah. was not entitled to this search. And uh, that's that was very difficult to to understand, and I think it worried everybody about the the script. You know, how do we make her likable? And right. and through, through no fault of Elizabeth Gilbert or anybody's, it just was a tricky business because it did feel like mostly men didn't like it. That's what it felt like, you know, that they, they were hurt and right. mystified that she would be so unhappy. 
I guess it's because I think that when it comes to the women's mystique, it's just like, okay, well, you, you know, as you said before, it's like, you know, the boyfriend's there, but at the end of the day, it's about, you know, inner happiness and you can't have inner happiness unless you're get rid of the mundane and find the inner happiness with inside you, which is about the search. And I guess when men on a whole look at women to a whole thing is that, well, all women want is re if they're in a good relationship and then that should be, be it, but they're not realizing that a man's not happy that way. So why would a woman need to be happy that way? Right. And I think that's probably, you know, but I think that also deals back to, you know, these all cultural you know, stereotypes about man and women and relationships. It's like you, the only way you can be happy is being in a relationship. But the thing is, you can't be happy in a relationship unless you're happy within yourself. Exactly. And in order to be happy within yourself, you're going to have to do a lot of soul searching. And then once you're happy within yourself, you'll find the, you know, if you are meant to have a life partner or whoever it's going to be, then you probably will have a, a great relationship. But you need to have all the elements. Yes. And you got to have two people who, who have this self-realization and how many people really do get happy with mm -hmm. themselves in you know people survive in relationships in or don't survive really hard to get okay you know make a make us a, a marriage inside themselves you know mm -hmm. bring the two elements of themselves together and then re, you know then bond with someone outside but it's very rare i think it's a rare thing um, and it's, it's, it's like the human condition in a way, this seeking and, uh, look, and, and in a way looking for that kind of romance is just a substitute for having it within your own heart. You know, well, my grandmother always says you can't find happiness into the, into someone else's eyes until you find the happiness in your own eyes. Right. Well, that's, that's. Lovely, because that has to do with seeing, seeing the beauty in other people. And you've got to be pretty, pretty cool to really see that. Yeah. Right. I think it made sense when Julia Roberts, I, the, one, the one line she goes, she goes, I want to enjoy food again. You know, it's like, <laughs> who doesn't get to that point where nothing tastes good? And, you know, that was such a relevant one sentence, you know, when she said that. It's like, God, that makes so much sense. It's like things just don't taste good sometimes. And. You know, and you do want to go off and find yourself and, and experience new things. I think that's normal, you know, for male or female. I think do you, so. Do you think you ever um, take another book and try to write another screenplay based on a book? <laughs> Was it a, something that you enjoyed or it's like? I have done it, but they haven't uh, made it to the screen. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I don't know if I'll do it again. Uh, you know, if, if I if the right book comes along, yeah. Everybody's much more interested in television right now. I see that. But well, I think that television is, it's kind of weird. I think films no longer are the maverick. It seems like television is the new maverick of storytelling. Yeah. And you can do, and if you notice, um, it's quite funny that soaps used to be looked down upon, whether it was Dallas or Dynasty or okay. Date time soaps but now every every tv show now is a soap so now you have your characters and they go on these long journeys and these long emotional awakenings and it's so serialized. on and so forth and i think that's probably why television is in the new golden age yeah but it's a different kind of television now and, though it isn't it because you get serials and you have net every, everything's a serial now which is nice oh there was a time when everybody yeah, because there was a time when everybody said, oh, no, we want standalone episodes. That's what they were called. Right, and, right. And, and any serialization was considered uh, contrary to attracting viewers or keeping viewers because, you know, you couldn't join in in the middle or whatever. Um, but now nobody wants a standalone episode. It's, it's, too, it's too light, you know, it's too... It, it isn't significant. It binge isn't. watching. Binge well, it's kind of, but it's kind of hard to do standalone now, anyway, because you know, even like in the seventies or the eighties, and let's sit there and say, Macmillan and wife, you know, pulling one out of the hat there. And any time that you know something would change in their relationship, and then you watch the next episode, it's like nothing happened, you know. Yeah. yeah, and you have to, as a writer, you have to think like that. So nothing can have that big of an impact. 
So you, you don't get the real drama because you really carry it forward into the next episode. Just dealing with a, we got the murderer. Right. Well, let, well, let's face it. If Murder, She Wrote was a long-running serial drama, then I think everyone would have figured that she was a serial killer. Right. Because no one goes to that many places and have that many people dying. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and nobody ever says that, except the audience. <laughs> like, whoa, they die every time she shows up. What's <laughs> me? One of the greatest minds since, um, you know, Ted Bundy. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so what we'll do is we'll wrap this up um what i thought um is there anything that you um like to tell our listeners about anything that you got coming in the pipeline or production anything ratchet's it i'm i'm on the writing staff of ratchet so um, and that will come back so that's that's what i'm doing other than that i'm just writing something for myself my own Pros. So what I'm going to do is say thank you, Jennifer Salt, for joining us on the Literary License Podcast. My pleasure. It was very gracious and... of you to come here, and it was a pleasure meeting you, and we look forward to all of your new endeavors, wherever they are and whenever they come down the road. Thank you. You guys are great. You're very thank great you. to you. been a literary license podcast production until next time and do not forget to comment or share we would so admirably appreciate your support